Welcome to Harpy Alaska Native News and Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining me. On today's program, we travel to Tanana, Alaska for a dog mushing symposium. We meet with over a dozen mushers as they share the history and some treasures of knowledge and wisdom. It's a great show. I'll be back with dog mushing from Tanana right after this. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Heartbeat Alaska would also like to thank Browns Electric for their generous support. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Comtech Business Systems Incorporated and by the Maniluk Association, providing health and social services to residents of Northwest Alaska for over 30 years. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Ed's Kasilov Seafoods. Welcome back. Over the years, dog mushing has changed from a necessity to a sport. We've gone from the trap line to the starting line. Join me now as we travel to Tanana, Alaska and learn about this timeless tradition. Go! called Nuchilawoya, the place where two rivers meet. It's here that the Tanana River runs into the mighty Yukon River. Just two miles west of this junction sits the Athabascan community of Tanana. Due to its location, Tanana was a traditional trading settlement for the Koyakon and Tanana Athabascans long before European contact. At the turn of the century, Tanana was a thriving village. In 1898, Fort Gibbon was founded at Tanana to maintain the telegraph line between Fairbanks and Nome, and the mighty Yukon became a highway for gold seekers who were headed north. Today, the Yukon River still serves as a highway, but in a much different fashion. For those who live along the Yukon and the many other rivers that run through Alaska, a busy highway means more than one dog team on the river. Here in Tanana, the Yukon River links many interior communities together and serves as a road system for the people of these villages. For centuries, the people of the Yukon have followed the rivers, whether it be for subsistence hunting and trapping or for traveling. 
Historically, the most common means of transportation for the people has always been dog sleds. With the invention of the snow machine, dog teams became used less and less for daily activities and eventually took on a new role. 30, Sprint and long distance racing. Today, dog mushing is a competitive sport with high tech gear and big money purses. The dogs are bred for speed and endurance and are quite different from the traditional sled dogs. Short hair Eurohounds have become popular racing dogs because of their slim builds and fast feet. The toboggan style work sleds, traditionally used for subsistence gathering, have been replaced with smaller, sleeker, and much lighter racing sleds. Yes, it's safe to say that dog mushing has changed drastically. For many people today, dog mushing is known as a tough sport, but for some, it's still remembered as a way of life that once was. I thought it'd be really a cool idea to, to invite a dog mushers here to Tanana because Tanana is such a dog mushing community. We've always been a real, um, really into dog mushing here in Tanana. And, and it's really uh, important for us to keep this tradition alive here. As part of the wellness initiative sponsored by the Alaska Federation of Natives, Julie Roberts of Tanana came up with the idea of holding a dog musher symposium as a way of promoting a healthy lifestyle through dog mushing. Guest dog mushers from across the state were invited to the symposium to discuss a variety of topics surrounding dog mushing and how running dogs has helped these athletes to live a healthy lifestyle. World-class mushers such as George Atma, Benedict Jones, Joe Reddington Jr., and Charlie Boulding, Lester Earhart, and countless others were invited to take part in this three-day symposium that shared the secrets of these champions and explored the timeless tradition of dog mushing. The design of the race sled didn't come out till mid-40s. Like we said, they would use freight sled for hauling freight and wood and stuff like that. In the old days, there never was any uh, sled designed for jeep pool. A lot of people use jeep pool for snowshoeing or a pair of skis in front of the sled to steer the big sleighs. So in the mid-40s, they finally came up with a shorter sled, four foot basket. Before that was average seven or eight foot basket sleds. That's what the people use. Bendik, you touched on an interesting, uh, the G pole. I don't think, you know, our, our kids over here, they probably don't even know what G pole is. And I know my mom used to, to ride on G pole, you know, to, to haul wood. But I think there's a lot of, you know, our younger people who don't even know what that even looked like or don't even, probably never even heard the word. <laughs> yeah, I just want to show you kids what the Jeep pool is. It's, it's uh, tight on the right-hand side from your front runner to the bow, and the pole is about five feet long, and you stand on a pair of skis on the front and that there's a, a wheel dog between you. So when you want to go around a curve, you just automatically, and there's rope attached to the ski. So when you fall off the skis, your, uh, the skis will go along with the dogs. Years ago, when we were building the sleds, uh, we used to tie them together with a uh, rope that we make out of moose hide. And now these new sleds, they're because of the flexibility that's wanted in the sled, we uh, we done away with all of that. And the sleds I'm building now are completely built out of uh, just using bolts and plastic and uh, some snow machine parts in there. The mushers and, discussed uh, everything from the old style sleds to the harnesses that were used were. decades ago. With, they were heavy leather collars. They were diameter about 10 inches maybe, real thick leather on them, and they had a wire sticking out on the ends. 
And uh, eventually I, I watch him build with uh, cotton webbing, build harnesses to it. And that was the neck collar. That's the part that slipped over the dog's neck. And he just pulled on this circle around his neck. They had this uh, single tray harness that would stick on the back. They used to call that gnome harness. And uh, they had that uh, harness that goes underneath the arm and one strap on the back. They call that sidewash harness. And uh, another one was a choke harness. I know the stickman used to use that uh, choke harness that goes right. But you know, we had choke harness. So you can't use it for working. For these dog mushers, it was an opportunity to reminisce about the good old days, reliving the experiences that have made them the heroes they are to many people around the world, both young and old. But more than that, it was a gathering of the pioneers of dog mushing, the ones who were there when running dogs changed from an everyday activity to a world-class sporting event. The backbone of dog mushing is the women. Because I was <laughs> because I was there. Henry Henry used to work every leave us every April to get on that plane. I had to. I was stuck with the dogs and the kids. I cut fish. I go. I had fish wheel up up to the river here. I get up early in the morning, go up there in the boat while the kids are sleeping. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> well, we're trying to save dog mushing, you know, and uh, kind of teach the kids the part of our culture. And, uh, and you know, it, it was part of our heritage. That's something that went with the, the Indian people all the time. Native people always had dogs. And, and, and the ones that stay in fish camp have dogs. I, I try to make sure that these kids learn stuff and try to set them all in the right direction. You know, that's, it's, it's very important that they get that way. So we'll go from hole to hole. Then when we get to the last hole, we'll pull the pole back out from under the water. During a short intermission, veteran musher Benedict Jones took time to show the kids some photos and teach them a little more about their heritage in a day gone by. Ice is about 16 inches thick. When you look at these mushers, you can see that the lifestyle they chose to pursue has not only brought them recognition and fame, but has kept them healthy and in good shape. The cardiovascular the thing in, in running dogs, the cardiovascular part, it really, uh, it keeps you, uh, it keeps you uh, heart pumping. Uh, I'm, I'm 62 years old and I have, you know, good cardi, good cardiovascular and, and uh, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of stamina that if I hadn't got into dogs when I was, I'm actually not very young, I was uh, like, what was I, 40? Uh, 38 years old when I first got into dogs. I was 40 years old, and uh, if I hadn't uh, got uh, did got into dogs, I wouldn't be nearly as good a physical condition as I am today. It's a sport that keeps you active, keep your mind active, and uh, like for instance, you you know you're handling their food all the time when it comes in, uh, either on a barge or or uh, airplane, you know, and uh, you have to handle all that stuff. And then every day they're drinking, well, uh, my kennel is very small right now, but they probably drink and eat about 10 gallons of food a day, you know, and you have to carry all that stuff, you know. And it just keeps you moving all the time, you know, and I'm uh, 71 years old now, and I still feel good, you know, I mean, for me, it makes me feel good, you know, I mean, I'm always doing something, you know, I mean, you know, even when you go out to water dogs in the morning, they're happy to see you, and it always makes your day, or my day, anyway. It was a healthy lifestyle, and 
when you have dogs, you have to care for them, and it kind of takes you away from other things, and you have to take care of them, make sure they got good bedding and they got good food and stuff like that. And you have to keep them exercised, and every day they require, you know, that you have to work on them. And I think that's one of the reasons why I stayed in such good shape. I always maintain that I tell the people, if I didn't have dogs, I'd be over 600 pounds or maybe dead already, you know. <laughs> when we come back, we'll show you what the residents of Tanana, Alaska are doing to keep dog mushing alive. Stay with us. It's a great show. Did you know that if the youth took money for prizes in dog mushing, they are now considered professionals? So, in order to deal with this, the residents of Tanana came up with a solution. And a signature from a famous dog musher does the trick. The Tanana Dog Musher Symposium was much more than an opportunity to learn about dog mushing from the pros. It was a weekend packed full of events for all ages. Kids want to, kids want to come up and uh, stand up for the dog race. Kids lined up to take part in the Junior Mushers Race, a three-mile sprint race up the Yukon River. He wants to go and sign up with Joey. He wants to be Joey's passenger. But they want to sign up. Yeah. Joey's got to sign up. He's right over there. He said to sign him up. Oh, okay. While the veteran mushers took the liberty of autographing awards for the Junior Mushers. First kick of draw is Ezra Conrad. <laughs> Number four. Second one is Cy Conrad. <laughs> Number six. Number three. But first, just like with the pros, these junior mushers had to attend a pre-race mushers meeting. If someone is catching you, just pull over the best you can so that they can get by so we don't have no dog angles. And we'll probably get a lot of people out there to help you guys all the way around or so. Um, if you can't break your feet, don't use the brake. If you have to, use the brake. It was obvious that these kids rode the runners before. One by one, they left the starting line. Oh. And one by one, teams cross the finish line. 
after the race. It was time to head back to the rec hall for a potlatch and the presentation of the awards. Third place was Ezra Conrad and Landon Erickson. Number two was Cy Conrad and Richard Nathaniel. And number one was Charlie Earhart and Rhiannon Summers. Thank you. There's an apparent sense of pride that glows from the youth of Tanana, whether they're running dogs or singing the songs of their ancestors. It's the kind of pride that can never be taken away from the Athabascans of interior Alaska, a pride that has been handed down from generation to generation. From the pounding drum in the center of the circle to the two-stepping shuffle of the fiddling music, the Athabascan people walk with their heads held high. Thank you everyone for joining me for Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. Join me again next week when we travel again to Tanana, Alaska and glean these pearls of wisdom from the dog mushers of the past. These guys are so tough and so ready to share their information. This is a great show. I hope you tune in. I'm Jeannie Green. God bless every single one of you and we'll see you again next week. I thought racers were up. Were up sort of nuts. I, uh, I'd, I'd uh, heard about George Atlin and I uh, read his story and I knew he was nuts. <laughs> so, so I didn't want nothing to do with that racing part. <laughs> I hope, hope George heard that. The thing that was going through in my uh, mind when I ran the Iditarod was I must be crazy, you know. And I really didn't uh, after it was over, I thought, it wasn't that bad, you know? So I tried it again, and that's when I really found out I was crazy then. Come on up, Pat. Oh. 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 Oh